Good evening, everyone. Welcome you all to Oncology Classroom Evening Session. Today evening, we are going to discuss something very interesting and usually a topic which is not very commonly discussed in this country. And the talk is on HDR brachytherapy in carcinoma prostate. And we are really fortunate to have Dr. Harish KP with us as our esteemed speaker. Dr. Harish KP is an alumnus of All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And he has been working in the same institute as an additional professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology. And Dr. Harish is uh, one of the very few radiation oncologists in this country who has been doing this uh, HDR brachytherapy for prostate cancer. And I know personally that he has been using a very novel technique, which is robot assisted, real time, trust guided. And <clears throat> there is many more things to learn from uh, Dr. Uh, Harish. And uh, without wasting any further time, I request sir, that uh, please take over the session and start your presentation. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, first of all, let me thank Dr. Dodul for this opportunity to discuss this uh, very important topic and also for the very nice words. Uh, and. Uh, uh, let, let, let this HDR prostate brachytherapy is a very important topic uh, when those who are dealing with the uro oncology. Next slide, please. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, in today's uh, uh, talk, I will be just covering these uh, aspects. Initially, I will be briefly discussing about the latest data on uh, the prostate cancer burden. Some basic things about uh, the prostate cancer management, like uh, staging, risk stratification, risk grouping. Uh, until we know these basic things, it may be very difficult to understand uh, the management of prostate cancers. Then a little bit about the basics of hypofractionation. Uh, then uh, the indications, doses, advantages of uh, HDR prostate brachytherapy. And uh, more importantly, how practically we can do a prostate brachytherapy in, in a patient like the preparation, the imaging, uh, the contouring, the doses, and uh, I'll also briefly discuss the uh, literature of uh, um, on, on prostate HDR. Next, please. Uh, uh, worldwide, uh, so, worldwide, the prostate cancer is uh, the second most common cancer among the males uh, with a proportion of 13.5% of all cancers. And uh, it is the fifth common cause of uh, deaths worldwide with 6.7 percentage of a share. And uh, the incidence wise, the age adjusted incidence of 29.3 and uh, it's the most prevalent cancer in, among males also. This is the 2018 latest global can data. Next please. In India, it is the sixth most common uh, cancer in males. Next, please. And if you see the different registries, you can see that uh, it's varied between the registries and it's more common in the, uh, in the urban registries like Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, etc. Next, please. And uh, if you see the most common uh, uh, sites, you can see that it is the, the, it is the uh, second most common uh, cancer in the, in the registry is from Kerala, then in Kolkata, and also from, from Pune. And this is the third most common cancer among males in Delhi, Bangalore, and uh, Mumbai. Next, please. And a little bit about the staging. T1 is a tumor uh, where there is no, uh, no findings on DRE, digital rectal examination. There is no finding on imaging. Uh, T1 is divided to T1A, B, and C. T1A, when the, when the prostate is removed for generally some other reason, you find less than 5% uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, cancer in the specimen. T1B, more than 5% of the specimen contains tumor. And T1C, uh, you, you know, there it is an incidental uh, detection by raised PSA. You get a corneal biopsy. You prostate cancer. T2 is unconfirmed. 
A stands for involvement of less than one one half of one side. Uh, uh, then T two B more than one half of one side, and T two C both sides are involved. And T three A it is involving the periprostatic tissues. T three B the seminal vesicle is involved, and T four uh, you can see that it is involving the adjacent structures. Next, please. Next. Yes, uh, the next important thing uh, we should know is the Gleason score. Uh, Gleason score is a uh, measure of the grade of the tumor. It's the degree of differentiation of the tumor tissue. It's graded from grade one to grade five. Grade one, uh, five, be, five being the worst. And you, you all know that uh, there is a primary score, a primary and the secondary uh, score. And th this primary and secondary score are added to get the final Gleason score. There is something known as Gleason grade grouping that is uh, that is now uh, used in grade group one. Uh, it is a Gleason of uh, Gleason of six. Grade group two, three plus four Gleason, and grade group three, four plus three, and grade group four. The total score is eight, and grade group five, it is the score is nine to ten. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, after knowing the Gleason uh, and the staging. The most important thing to know is the NCC and risk stratification. This is very important, especially for the PG postgraduate students, because uh, until we know this uh, very in detail, it will be very difficult to manage a case of prostate cancer. We don't know which, which, which what to give to for an individual patient. This prostate cancer is divided into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. These are three main divisions. In the low risk, it's a tumor with a T1 to T2A, uh, Gleason of less than or equal to 6 and a PSA of less than 10. If all the three are there, we call it a low risk. For intermediate risk, it is uh, T2B to T2C or you have a Gleason of 7 or a, P or a PSA of 10 to 20. And in the high risk, you have a T3A or a Gleason of uh, 8 or more and a PSA of 20 or more. If anything is there, then the concerned uh, group it will be assigned. And there are other additional groups like the very low risk, where you see it is a T1C uh, tumor with less than three cores are positive, uh, less than 50% in each core, and the PSA density is less than 0.15 nanogram per ml per gram. If all these three are there, then we call it as very low risk. And intermediate risk is also divided into two groups, the favorable intermediate risk and the unfavorable intermediate risk. The fa for favorable intermediate risk, uh, uh, this is uh, if there is only one intermediate risk factor. That means intermediate risk factor, by that means either T stage or Gleason or PSA. Is, or there's only one intermediate risk factor and the percentage of the biopsy course is less than 50 percent. And it is a primary, it is a grade group two, that, is, that means three plus four. They, it is taken as a favorable intermediate risk. The rest, uh, all intermediate risk are taken as an unfavorable intermediate risk. And uh, there is some, also one more category known as the very high risk group. It is T3B to 4 and if, uh, if there is a primary it is Gleason pattern of 5 or more than 4 cores with a Gleason score of 8 to 10 or there are 2 or 3 high risk uh, features are there. Then it is taken as very high risk. Knowing this uh, grouping is very important because the treatment decision is based on this risk stratification. Next, please. Yes. Uh, this shows broadly the treatment allocation according to the risk groups. Uh, you know, for a broad purpose, we can club the very low risk, low risk, and the favorable intermediate risk into one category, and the unfavorable intermediate risk and the high risk into the other category. The low risk, very low risk, and intermediate risk, uh, favorable intermediate risk, risk uh, there is an option of uh, active surveillance or active monitoring that we talk called and uh, it, after the after the results from the protect trial it has shown that whether you do active monitoring or you do active treatment the results are same 
but there is one one observation that the patients were considered for active monitoring over a, at least a good proportion of patients over a time will be considered for active treatment uh, uh, maybe because the patient preference or because the tumor progression and all so uh, one active monitoring is one important uh, treatment aspect in low risk very low risk and uh, favorable intermediate risk group but if at all the patient is considered for treatment uh, either you, the patient can be considered for radical brachytherapy alone or external beam radiotherapy or radical surgery all the three the results are will be equal and for the in intermediate unfavorable intermediate and the high risk group the generally external beam radiation uh, with uh, brachytherapy boost is the most preferred option and if the patient can be considered for uh, external beam radiotherapy alone also or the patient can be some patients may be considered for uh, surgery um, but when the issue with uh, the considering for surgery is that more many of patients will develop have indications for post operative radiotherapy and uh, they will end up in receiving two different uh, treatment options as far as uh, the hormone therapy is concerned the low risk uh, cancers do, doesn't need any hormone therapy the you know, the unfavorable intermediate risk and the high risk uh, will require hormone therapy and for for the intermediate risk the duration of hormone therapy is short and the 6 months adt is preferred and for the high risk 2 to 3 years of adt is preferred adt has shown a survival advantage in high risk group next please yes um, it is much evidence from the external beam radiation literature that uh, uh, higher the dose uh, for the prostate cancer higher the better, better the biochemical disease free survival there is no evidence of an uh, overall survival advantage by increasing the dose so higher the dose better the results in prostate cancer next please how next please how can we escalate the dose uh, the uh, the one of the important ways of escalating is by using high end high tech techniques like uh, the imrt vmat um, then the other, the other important thing is to use hypofractionation i will be coming to this in the next slide but uh, hypofraction can be either a moderate hypofraction or an extreme hypofraction that used in sbrt in external beam the topic of today's discussion the brachytherapy is the best way of achieving um, the dose escalation in prostate cancers next please and uh, this shows uh, the brachytherapy is the most conformal uh, technique that is available as of today the main advantage of brachytherapy compared to external beam is that whenever we give external beam radiation the dose has to reach the prostate from outside that means the radiation crosses through the skin subcutaneous tissue the bladder rectum and then it has to reach the bladder and reach the prostate so uh, but when you give we use brachytherapy it is the dose coming from inside out so uh, the uh, the extent of dose escalation that you can achieve by brachytherapy you cannot think of achieving by any any way of external beam next please uh, the the most important thing is the uh, very high dose that occurs in just near the needles that means the 150 percentage and the 200 percentage dose that occurs near the needle that you cannot achieve by any uh, any any radiotherapy technique next please this is a very interesting slide that uh, distinguishes external beam techniques from the brachytherapy you can see that uh, the, the upper upper panel shows the external beam techniques uh, here uh, whenever we do a 3d crt plan or imrt plan we try to achieve 95% coverage and uh, 95 to 100% area uh, doses uh, reached in uh, the ptb area and uh, uh, we can, we we can decrease the dose to urethra a little bit by using imrt Um, when we do the stereotactic body radiotherapy uh, it's a routine practice uh, and when, and we usually try to escalate the dose within the tumor above 111 percentage and uh, inevitably uh, we end up in, this, in giving a hot spot near the urethra you, you can see the urethra is in the center so you the almost uh, inevitably will be uh, you try to control the dose but still you get a very high dose within the urethra even though we achieve a very good coverage and dose escalation but if you see the lower two graphs you can see that the hdr brachytherapy or ldr brachytherapy you uh, increase the dose within the area within the prostate but uh, then uh, there is a good sparing of the urethra uh, that you can see and uh, the uh, mostly the prostate cancer occurs in the, uh, the in the peripheral zone so if there are needles in the peripheral zone you can safely escalate the dose to the uh, tumor bearing area 
at the same time controlling the dose to the urethra. That means you are able to sculpt the dose to the prostate where the dose is needed. Next, please. Yes, a little bit about uh, what hypo, the hypo, radiopathology of hypofraction prostate cancer. Uh, more, we know that the alpha by beta ratio for the prostate cancer is uh, between 1.2 to 1.5 gray. For the acute reaction tissues, the OIRs, the alpha beta is taken as a 10, and for the late reacting, uh, late reactions is taken as 3. This difference in alpha beta ratio is between the prostate and the surrounding OIR is exploited when we use hypofractionation. We know that the BD, BD, the formula is ND into 1 plus D by alpha by beta. So whenever there is a low alpha by beta ratio, we get a very high BD. Compared uh, this difference in BD between the um, PTB and the, and the prostate and the OIR is being exploited. So uh, the, the LQ model generally uh, considers the uh, the, uh, the the DNA damage for uh, modeling, but there are other ways of uh, cell kill that are inherent with a very high dose per fraction, like the lipid membrane phosphorylation, the apoptosis, the immune mediated cell death. All these add to the more cell kill with um, with uh, high hypofractionation. Also, there are some literature uh, which shows that the high dose per fraction that we uh, that we use initially. Lead to the some transcriptomic changes within the genome, which lead to uh, the the enhancement of the radio sensitizing genes, which can radio sensitize the tumor for further radiation. So this is another way of uh, increasing the effect by using uh, hypofractionation in prostate cancer. Next, please. Uh, whenever we go for hypofractionation. Uh, uh, the most important thing is to keep the uh, keep the margins as less as possible and also do a proper image guidance when we uh, the importance is because if we deliver this high dose to the oir the whole game is spoiled you will have a lot of toxicities and you will not achieve the result also this um, important even for external limb radiotherapy and when we do external limb radiotherapy we have in different image guidance and technologies that are available but I, I would just just like to mention about the uh, the real time uh, transperineal ultrasound guidance that we use in our department. The clarity ultrasound for S SBRT or any other uh, technique for the prostate cancer, which is an excellent way of uh, monitoring and uh, during the delivery of uh, uh, high dose fractions. Next, please. And this is another technique that we are not doing. We are not doing. Uh, which is important to, uh, to, for dose escalation. Uh, this is known as OIR spacer, uh, where the gel spacer is inserted in the space between the prostate and the rectum uh, by, uh, to, by transperineal, through transperineal route. This helps to decrease, increase the gap between the prostate and the rectum so that you can escalate the dose to the prostate and decrease the dose to the rectum. And uh, the issue with this technique is that uh, this cannot be used for any, any tumor above T2, that means T3, especially there is a posterior involvement, you cannot use it. And it is, it is an invasive procedure and a lot of in, uh, some issues with infection and all. Next, please. It's one of the earliest reports of uh, uh, prostate brachytherapy dates back to 1917 JAMA paper. Uh, with by paper by Baringer et al., where he described the results of one year uh, results of his uh, radium uh, uh, prostate brachytherapy. Uh, where you can see, you can just read the forward that written by K Case, where uh, he is uh, uh, mentioning about the skepticism associated with the, in the, among the community, and he is mentioning that uh, he himself has witnessed the results of uh, prostate cancer brachytherapy. Very interesting to read, but uh, I mean, just you can go through this. Next, please. And uh, initially, it started with uh, LDR. LDR, uh, they use uh, permanent seeds, uh, radio, um, this, uh, in, uh, seeds like uh, gold seeds, uh, then iodine 125, palladium 103 seeds. The HDR is a temporary brachytherapy procedure, and where we use uh, iridium 192. The difference between HD, LDR and HDR, it is LDR is a single uh, outpatient procedure, but HDR is usually done as a multiple insertions. And it's done uh, by after admission, overnight admissions. And uh, it, there's some risk of uh, exposure to the healthcare worker during LDR, uh, but there is no risk of radiation exposure in HDR. 
uh, you are able to sculpt the dose into the area where you need with HDR. That much dose sculpting is not possible with HDR. Once the needle are in, once the seeds are inserted, you may not be able to change the positions of the seeds. But by changing the dwell positions and uh, dwell, dwell times, you will be able to manipulate the dose in HDR. There's a difference in the uh, toxicity profile also. Uh, we can see that acute effects are more with uh, LDR. And also uh, the, the occurrence of this, uh, uh, the duration of this uh, uh, acute effects are more with LDR compared to HDR. And there is also the sequence of the occurrence of this uh, acute effects also are also different. For an LDR, uh, the, the, the acute effects come late within weeks to months, but for HDR, the acute effects come early, hours to days. Uh, regarding the cost, it's a relative term. A LDR is supposed to be a little more costly because uh, you have to make the source for individual patients. But HDR, you, you can use it for other cases like cervix also or any other brachytherapy procedure. And uh, the both LDR and HDR are operator dependent, dependent, but there is little lesser operator dependency with HDR. Next, please. Yes, this is another interesting thing. Uh, there is a less inverse square law for HDR. That means uh, um, the, uh, the, um, the LDR is more conformal than HDR. But um, I, I see this from a different perspective. Uh, for example, when there is a bigger prostate, uh, uh, with, with there is a pubic arch interference, you need to throw the dose to the periphery of the prostate, uh, especially anteriorly, when there is a tumor there. So, uh, in those cases, HDR will be preferred over LDR because by LDR, you may not be able to put, uh, put the seeds in all those areas. By, but in HDR, uh, because of this principle, this phenomenon, you will be able to throw the dose further. Next, please. What is the ideal patient for uh, prostate brachytherapy? I will tell that in any, any prostate patient who is uh, having an organ confined disease is fit for prostate brachytherapy uh, unless there are other contraindications. I mean, uh, for the patient for monotherapy, it is either a low risk disease or a favorable intermediate risk disease. And uh, for, a, uh, for a brachytherapy boost, it is high, either a high risk disease or an unfavorable intermediate risk disease. And the details regarding this uh, group classification, I have already described in detail, so I'm not going to detail it again. Next please. What are, there are some absolute contraindications for a, a brachytherapy. <clears throat> a pre-existing uh, rectal fistula, nobody would like to create, um, um, uh, damage, uh, do more damage to the fistula. Then uh, the patients who are unfit for anesthesia, if there is a no proof of malignancy, or for a trust guided procedures, if there is no rectum, we are not going to go ahead. And other, in, other contraindication is ataxia till injectasia. Next, please. There are some relative contraindications also. Patients who have received prior pelvic radiation, uh, prior rectal surgery, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, large prostate, which uh, that's a very relative contraindication only. Previously, it was taken as a very strict contraindication, but nowadays it's not taken as a strict one. If, um, for prostate, we have more than 60 cc. Sorry. Or whenever there's whenever you encounter with a bigger prostate, the rule is you go for an urophlometry study and see the peak flow rate. If peak flow rate is uh, uh, more than 10, it's okay. And if the post voidal residue is uh, more than uh, 100, then you have to worry. And uh, if there is a large median lobe, it may be very difficult to you know, implant also. And if the IPS score is more than 20, then also people are not considered for brachytherapy. When there is some relative contraindication. And another thing is pubic arch interference, in the interference. That means anteriorly you are not able to cover the prostate uh, completely because of a bigger prostate and the pubic arch interfering in your field. Uh, but you can overcome this by increasing the dwell times in the anterior needles or by manipulating your implant during your insertion. And the other, thing, other relative contraindication is a huge unhealed uh, TRP defects. Next please. Yes. Uh, coming to the monotherapy, uh, there are different dose schedules that are being used. Uh, uh, people do generally single insert, single implants are not not favored for a monotherapy. There are multiple implants that are two or three implants are generally preferred. And uh, uh, even uh, if in even if you if you're, even if you are giving two implants, uh, people some some people who use uh, two fractions for each implant also. So the fractions may vary from two to four or even more also. 
but on an average, uh, but what we should understand is that the final bead is what what is more important. Anybody will like to achieve a bead of uh, two fifty or more. Next, please. Uh, for the uh, for the bracket therapy boost protocols, that means uh, initially, initially or later, you will give an external membrane therapy, which covers either the prostate only or the prostate plus the nodes whenever there are indications. And the dose that are used for this external beam protocols are varied among different centers. It can anyway vary between uh, 45 and 25 fractions or, um, uh, or uh, 46 grain, 23 fractions or 37.5 grain, 13 fractions or 37.5 grain, uh, 15 fractions. Anything, I mean, just we have to give an uh, average dose of 45 and 25, that's all for the prostate and, uh, uh, and the nodes whenever they're indicated. And either bracket therapy is done initially or later or indicated. And uh, uh, Martinez initially tried three fraction uh, boost protocols, uh, different doses varying from 5.5, 6 gray, 6.5. Yeah. Then uh, he shifted to two fraction regimens of uh, 8.25, 9.5, 10.5, and 11.5. And then later on, single fraction uh, boost protocols with uh, using 15 gray. This is the most uh, preferred, uh, most preferred protocol, 15 gray single fraction is the most preferred uh, boost protocol nowadays. Uh, Martinez has shown that uh, uh, whenever we are using uh, uh, bracket therapy for a boost, the aim should be, uh, should be to get a BED of a 268, around 268 gray. Uh, that is, should be the aim for any combi protocols. Next please. Uh, uh, the, the some guidance from American Bracket Therapy Society that published in 2012, uh, where they had listed different uh, dose regimens, a little bit old guidance, but still uh, somebody can go through this uh, if, if they're really interested in knowing the uh, further intricacies. And uh, they are also given uh, the guidance for uh, the OER doses. Next, please. Uh, if you see the latest NCCN guidelines, uh, these are the acceptable regimen that they recommend and uh, for HDR, for HDR monotherapy, uh, they are recommending 13.5 gray into two, uh, two, two uh, implants or 9.5 gray BID into two, two implants. For HDR uh, um, uh, uh, co combination, the, the boost therapy, it is 15 gray single fraction, the most recommended one or it can be a 10.5 gray in two, into two fractions, two, two, two implants or two frat settings. Next, please. Yes, uh, regarding the sequencing of uh, uh, bracket therapy, uh, it can be either bef uh, done before external beam uh, uh, ready therapy or it can be concurrent, uh, it can be either interdigitated between the ex external membrane therapy or it can be done after finishing external membrane therapy. Whichever way you do, all the results are all equal and there is no clear winner between these. But many institutions follow initial bracket therapy for a few reasons. Uh, one most important reason is that people who are using fiducials, we, particularly we don't use fiducials because we are doing clarity transpendial. But the people who are using fiducials, it will be a good advantage for them because they will be able to implant the fiducials during the same sitting as bracket therapy. The another thing is that, logistical thing is that uh, there are some data telling that high dose bracket therapy given initially can reduce sensitize the tumor uh, because of the transcriptomic changes that are happening. So this can be utilized uh, uh, for further uh, external membrane radiation. Next, please. Yes, the, the implant procedure is basically uh, patient is in a lithotomy position. There is a tra transrectal ultrasound probe, which is usually fixed to a, uh, a stepper. Either it's a couch mounted or a floor mounted stepper, or it can be free. Uh, it can be held in hand also. And the uh, needles and the template is attached to the uh, stepper generally, and uh, or it can be uh, it can be fixed to the perineum by suturing. And the needles are inserted through this uh, template uh, transperineally to the prostate into the prostate. Next, please under trust guidance. Uh, practically, how um, we do the procedure. Yes, uh, in, the, in fact, after 2013, we incorporated the bracket therapy in the prostate cancers. 
and uh, we started with the 45 grade 25 grade, uh, fractions of uh, whole pelvic radiation followed by two sessions of 9.5 uh, uh, 9.5 gray per session for hdr and initially we gave, gave two sitting six hours apart with a single implant and the insertion was done under ultrasound guidance next please yes whenever we start the prostate bracket therapy procedure before that i think it should be most important thing should be to get accustomed with the ultrasound images the transrectal images it's very important because uh, in the initial uh, when you start the procedure it will be very difficult for you to uh, uh, to position the probe in the rear in the right position uh, it might uh, it might seem very uh, trivial but uh, it's very important because the probe has to be positioned very uh, rightly then only you will get a very good image you need to get that the coronal and sagittal images very clearly then only you will be able to do a very good implant and uh, the right template has to be chosen you can use the, the round template or the martinez template whichever you pick whichever is it and uh, next please yes uh, yeah, initially uh, for a beginner it will be very difficult to uh, know the position of the uh, to position where to place the template in the perineum so what we started when we started we try, we started with using a, a lumbar puncture needle we used four lumbar puncture needles and we inserted this lump, lp needles through the perineum uh, to see whether the needle are hitting the, the periphery of the prostate or not and then uh, we through by ultrasound guidance we located the position and then we marked that area of the uh, the projection of the prostate in the perineum by gb paint or by uh, then we sutured this uh, template to the perineum over this uh, marks because this and there's a lot of learning curve that happens when you start the bracket prostate bracket therapy procedure it is not simple as we hear uh, because initially when you start the needles might be might go here and there uh, so uh, it's better to start with uh, by using uh, these techniques like uh, in initially inserting the lp needle and localizing the projection of the prostate then uh, suturing it next please and then uh, once the uh, prostate uh, template is uh, uh, stabilized then you insert uh, needles one by one through the uh, through the uh, the holes in the in the in the in the, in the template under transrectal ultrasound guidance each needle has to be verified properly uh, when you insert uh, one most important thing is that you have to start from the anterior needle not from the posterior needle once you put a posterior needle there will be lot of acoustic shadows that will be there so it will be difficult for you to see the anterior needle so the golden principle is you start with the anterior needle and then uh, then go uh, posteriorly next please uh, another thing that you will encounter uh, when you start the prostate bracket therapy procedure is that uh, you will gen generally you do with a uh, uh, with a police inside but well, you have to put, put inside the police first the 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 the, the, the um, uh, when when uh, the when the when you put inside the needle the balloon of the police will be just above the thing above, just above the prostate so once the needle punctures the prostate and then comes in the bladder the needle is going to prick the balloon and then uh, the folies is going to come out so it will be really messy to put the folies again so it is the golden principle to push the folies as further as possible and then to uh, just uh, uh, stick the folies to the uh, urethra uh, so that you don't puncture the balloon next please and uh, usually we need 14 to 18 needles minimum 14 needles you need uh, to get a very good coverage and the needles has to be placed 7 to 10 mm apart if it is more than 1 1 cm apart then you may not get a very good dosimetry uh, uh, it's generally we need to uh, insert uh, two third of the needles in the periphery of the gland and one third should be in the central part Uh, the needles has to be placed 5 mm away from the urethra and the uh, the, uh, the needles whenever we are inserting the needles uh, there are diff there will be little difference opinion between the different authors but the most accepted principle is that the needle has to be inside the bladder you have to puncture the bladder uh, because if you don't puncture the bladder you will not be able to get a good dose in the uh, base Uh, in, in, in the base of the prostate, uh, you have to go 
into the bladder there will be a little into hematuria but don't worry but it has to be inside the bladder then only you will be able to cover the prostate very well if you hesitate to, to puncture the bladder you may not get a good coverage especially when you do the city based planning i will come to that detail in coming in the, in the coming slides but and another thing is that the posterior needles has to be placed in such a way that it is 5 mm inside the capsule so that we were able to give adequate dose to the posterior part of the prostate and at the same time to spare the rectum next please after placing the needles you are happy with the implant then the patient started for ct for planning next please and uh, uh, the treatment planning images are done and uh, if you are doing a ct then ct is the treatment planning image if you are uh, doing the ultrasound based planning ultrasound can be used for treatment planning or if you are doing mri that different different images that can use uh, when, the other other thing is that if you are doing a multi parametric imaging uh, mri then uh, that can be used to identify that uh, the dominant intraprostatic lesion to boost the lesion if you are doing a protocol also and after after the images are imported to, the, to your tps uh, the needles are reconstructed and they are identified the ptp and ors are conducted next please and uh, uh, that the target delineation is the next uh, uh, step uh, generally PT, the ptv is equal to the ctv when you are doing a prostate brachytherapy the uh, the, the ptv is the whole prostate plus any extra prostatic extensions uh, that means any very prostatic involvement is there or if there is an extension to semi seminal vesicle they are also taken in the ptb and for this for this there is a expansion that is given a 3 mm expansion is there but you have to be careful that you don't give this 3 mm expansion uh, in, in just near the rectum or at the bladder and uh, the ors are also conducted like the bladder rectum and the urethra next please yeah Uh, then uh, the planning is done it can be either a forward planning or inverse plan depending on the tps that you are using and then uh, the plan evaluation is a very important step uh, you have to uh, under do uh, generally the volume that received 100% of the prescribed dose should be more than uh, 95% the dose received by 90% 90% of the prostate ptv should be more than 100% and uh, jackestro has given some guidance regarding the oir doses Uh, in the uh, that means in the qd2 that means uh, the whole dose that uh, that should be given by uh, the external beam contribution from the external beam and from the brachytherapy next please and uh, apart from this quantitative plan evaluation one most important step that you have to do is the qualitative plan evaluation you have to see slice by slice the uh, on, on on your tps the dose distribution in the prostate and in the oir and you have to see that you are not missing a very important cr crucial area especially where you are suspecting a disease if you are having a very good dosimetry and if you are under dosing an area where you are having the disease then uh, you will be failing in this procedure so uh, the qualitative dose evaluation is also very critical when you do the brachytherapy and you have to do see the 3d dose distributions also and after that you take the patient for treatment next please and in the city based workflow uh, the, uh, when uh, initially you are in, in, in planning in the or then you taking for ct and if you if you see that needles are not in the right position then is you need to reinsert it in many times you need anesthesia for that so overall the workflow takes 5 to 6 hours next please and uh, when, the, when you insert the needle in the lithotomy position in the or and when before shifting the patient to the ct you are removing the patient from the lithotomy to the lying down position so uh, the, uh, during this procedure during this repositioning uh, there is a displacement definitely there is a displacement of the needles that happens we had observed that even the needle can move 1 to 2 cm down and uh, 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 then uh, we need to reposition the needles when we do the ct another important thing is that you are changing the position from the lithotomy to the lying down position there will be little bit of distortion in the geometry also that means 
there will be uh, there will be there will be crowding of the needles after that the little bit of crowding that is also we are observed when when we are reposting the patient next please and uh, in this workflow there is a shifting of patients at least four times uh, during the treatment during before treatment so next please so this shifting is go definitely going to uh, shift your needles it is going to uh, affect your target coverage it is going to increase the or dose to your oars it is going to be traumatic for your patient traumatic injury to your tissue for the patient and it can increase the hematuria which is inherently associated with the prostate bacteria next please and uh, one of the publication by nisar site uh, you can see that uh, uh, there is a mean displacement of 7.6 mm and a maximum displacement of 28 mm 25 mm in this study and they have shown that the displacement is downwards in all the all, all the cases so uh, nobody can underestimate that the needle displacement uh, when you are doing this procedure when you are using a the ultrasound guided insertion and a ct based planning next please keeping this in background and uh, i i was very fortunate to have a fellowship with uh, at sana clinic mohan back in germany uh, to get training under the uh, big leaders of hdr brachytherapy professor samboglo uh, the nikos selis and as of date i am the the biggest hdr the, the uh, hdr literature is from uh, the professor samboglo the largest series are from this group next please and uh, there i learned the real time ultrasound guided hdr brachytherapy uh, for the prostate cancer basically this is onsenda prostate is also known as previously known as swift this is a robotic uh, one first degree robotic uh, procedure and uh, after the, uh, once we started this uh, procedure we shifted uh, uh, for the boost implants we uh, gave we started doing two separate implants next please and just show the what is the setup that for this procedure and there is a tps on a trolley that you can see in the first image and there is an ultrasound that you need for this procedure the, the tps the on center prostate tps and the ultrasound and then in the third image you can see the uh, the uh, the uh, the stepper it can be either a floor mounted stepper this is a floor mounted stepper or a couch mounted stepper that is very important for this procedure and the ultrasound probe is fixed on this stepper I, and you can see that it is already fixed on this stepper and there is a uh, the template is also fixed on this stepper and the patient is in a high lithotomy position and you need uh, the hdr machine in the same room next please uh the 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 peculiarity of this procedure is that there is no movement at all uh, during the procedure or after the procedure because the insertion the imaging the planning everything and delivery everything is done in the same procedure without any movement uh, patient is inside the or and the complete treatment is over in the or so you have to convert your hdr room into the or you cannot do the procedure in one room and give treatment in the other room the hdr room has to be converted into the operating room so you need an ot table good ot table with the lithotomy facility then good illuminations then anesthesia facility should be there in the hdr room itself then more important is the remote monitoring for anesthesia for the patient, monitoring the patient under anesthesia from outside the uh, that means from the console hdr console and you need audio visual setup in the console it's pretty well this setup is exactly same as any any iort setup so you have to modify the hdr room accordingly next please and uh, before the uh, procedure before taking the patient for any uh, any prostate bacterial procedure these things has to be taken care uh, you have to stop any blood thinners at least uh, for 5 days in advance and uh, you have to check the blood counts biochemistry generally i prefer to start the antibiotic on the day of the implant and complete bowel preparation has to be done uh, we use pegleg for that 
on the day prior and the patient is advised for soft diet on two day, at least two days prior and part preparation of course next please and uh, uh, the anesthesia generally they prefer is the epidural or uh, spinal anesthesia and the uh, patient high lithotic position then cleaning and draping the three way folies are inserted there should be high up as already told the scrotum is strapped to the perineum and uh, uh, the truss and the uh, uh, tumbler are assembled and uh, more and another important thing is that you have to clean the rectum of any stools and mucus because if you are not cleaning the rectum uh, properly before the procedure if some stool comes in between the image is distorted and you are not able to do the procedure so you have to clean the rectum before the procedure and then ultrasound is done next please and uh, 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 another important step in this is that you, we routinely insert the anchor needles these are two metallic needles with a small hook at the tip that are inserted under ultrasound guidance on either side of the urethra uh, transperineally through the tumblate and then the hooks are uh, the, the prosthetic is hooked to this needle and this uh, is fixed to the tumblate so that the prosthetic doesn't move um, uh, forward and backward prosthetic is not a fixed structure it can move uh, on on its own when we insert the needle so this is very important as is very important especially for a small prostate because if you do not doing this hooking procedure then um, prostate you might not be able to uh, implant properly and then after this uh, anchor needle is inserted 3d ultrasound image is secured uh, by moving the uh, automatically moving the uh, stepper uh, stepper in steps and then once the 3d images are obtained you uh, you do the contouring on the tps that is uh, just adjacent to it then you uh, pre design you do a pre plan by pre plan what we mean is that we design uh, where all to put the needles and then our physicist does a planning uh, after the contouring contouring uh, the ptv oyas a contour and then uh, the plan is made and see the dosimetry that we are or whether we are able to cover the ptv properly whether we are able to achieve the dose to the oyas properly and then once we are ready with the plan Uh, next please uh, we will be we will have the uh, projection of the template on our uh, tps that means the, wherever the holes of that in the template are there uh, it will be projected on our tip or tps uh, x axis is named as abcd the holes and the y axis is named as 1 2 3 4 so a1 stands for the first hole and a2 the second hole a2 the second hole higher up so we know uh, the each and every needle positions are coded in this uh, procedure so uh, we uh, we have a plan where to insert the needle from the pre plan we know where to insert the needle which hole to insert the needle and uh, accordingly uh, the physicist will tell to insert the needle b1 b2 b3 similarly or c3 c2 and all and accordingly the needles are inserted under under truss guidance into the prostate so the prostate is not moving it is fixed it is hooked to the template and so we just insert the needle by swift action inside the prostate and then uh, once uh, the the needle insertion is over according to the pre plan then you again get a 3d 3d ultrasound again uh, when you get the ultrasound you usually get 2 cm above and 2 cm below the prostate also and then uh, you do the again you uh, draw the ptv the ors in, in on the ultrasound image then you reconstruct the needles and then you make a final plan again once you achieve all the oir and dosimetries and the ptv dosimetries then you connect uh, the um, the the needles to the hdr machine and including the anesthetist uh, the radiation oncologist anesthetist everybody comes outside the hdr room the, uh, to the console and then the treatment is delivered in the same lithotomy position once the treatment is over the needles are removed in, uh, in the same position and then you apply uh, good pressure on the perineum to control the bleeding and then you have to start the irrigation for bladder because hematuria is a routine thing that we see after uh, after prostate brachytherapy but nothing to worry you have to be a little vigilant that's all you wash the bladder with the saline uh, within a matter of hours it gets settled so some patients they get it within uh, within minutes or within hour, hours next please 
and uh, this just shows our uh, doses and dose constraints that we follow in our department and this is basically uh, courtesy of uh, sana clinicum up and back and uh, i'm not going to the details uh, in which is monotherapy it is a 11.5 gray uh, insertion into three sitting three separate settings three weeks apart and uh, if it is a boost insertion it is 10.5 gray into into two sittings that also you can we two weeks or three weeks apart next week next next place and uh, this is the dosimetry that you achieve after the procedure we you were able to sculpt the dose to the ptv at, at the same time decreasing dose to the ir next place and post implant uh, uh, you have to prescribe anti inflammatory antibiotics and uh, for uh, urinary obstruction uh, alpha blockers may be needed i have already described about bladder irrigation nothing to worry only thing vigilant and the police you can remove on the next day and discharge the patient next please and other way of doing the brachytherapy is mr uh, mr based or mr guided brachytherapy and uh, here uh, the advantage is that you can use the dil information for uh, from the multiparametric images and uh, next please either you can be mr uh, based planning or mr both mr guided plan mr based planning uh, insertion and mr based planning also but the issue with mr uh, mr procedures is that uh, we basically we don't do this mr based procedures but still for theoretical purpose it takes 7 uh, hours together our uh, uh, swift procedure takes 2 to 3 hours all together and uh, uh, and of course in mr based uh, plan, plan, planning and um, and ultrasound based insertion there is a shifting of patient that is involved and you need mr compatible needles and there is a limited bore size so it will be difficult for you to work uh, during the insertion and uh, mr compatible hdr is not available as of now so uh, these are all issues with mr based uh, techniques next please and little bit about the literature you can see this is the literature for monotherapy lot of institutions and uh, pretty good number of patients from different institutions and um, uh, you can see that the biochemical control is pretty good and uh, Uh, let's talk series next please and uh, to summarize that results uh, the five year uh, uh, predem from bicycle failure should uh, in any risk group to be should be above 85 percentage if you do hdr bracket therapy five year os should be more than 95 percentage and prostate cancer specific mortality should be less than 4 percentage and local recurrence and uh, metastasis descent rate less than 4 percentage next please this is the literature uh, summarized literature of boost bracket therapy and uh, different institutions has followed different uh, external beam doses and different uh, uh, bracket therapy doses and uh, different sequencing also but overall next slide please overall the uh, results uh, the five uh, that that you can expect is five year uh, uh, freedom from bacterial failure for low risk 85 to 100 percent generally people don't do for low risk but in the for intermediate and high risk but for intermediate is 80 to 90 98 percentage for high risk 59 to 96 percentage and then prostate cancer risk survival of 99 to 100 percentage and os of 85 to 100 percentage and local recurrence up to zone of uh, 8 to 12 percent metastasis 12 percentage and uh, 10 year results also next please and uh, there are three important uh, uh, studies uh, for boost bracket therapy the randomized control studies I mean that because others are all non non randomized these are these three are the randomized control studies comparing external beam alone versus uh, bracky boost uh, the satya study and the hoskin study used hdr and asendar to use the ldr so uh, they have shown that uh, uh, there is uh, definitely statistically significant ad advantage uh, in uh, biochemical disease free survival when you uh, when you use uh, hdr boost compared to external beam alone Uh, but next place uh, next place this is the, this is the hoskin study next please yes uh, but uh, it failed to give any overall survival advantage uh, next please this may be because of the uh, low bed uh, because they, they this study has used lesser doses overall lesser doses uh, the bed was uh, less overall bed was less in this studies so that may be because of the low bed um, but there are no randomized trial phase so we, we have to wait for we have to we cannot uh, give comment about that regarding the toxicities the acute toxicities the, there is a list of acute toxicities but to mention 
uh, urinary retention up to tone of 11 percentage the grade 2 grade 2 10 and grade 3 1 percentage frequency up to 18 percentage these are acute toxicities but hematuria 11 percentage but on, there's only 2 percent grade 3 hematuria next please but regarding the late toxicities uh, uh, one one late toxicity that i would like to mention is uh, the structure urethral structures especially the bulbo urethral structures that is mentioned in literature and we also had few patients of bulbo urethral structures initially and uh, uh, that is because of the dose that uh, the excess dose that goes to the very sensitive bulbo urethral component so if you are very careful in planning you will be able to decrease this uh, late complication but if it happens, you have to go send the patient for dilatation. And the other GU and GA toxicities are very negligible. Next, please. And uh, just to show the, our, our study uh, that compared external meme alone versus external meme plus boost. Next, please. And in this uh, 30 patient study, uh, next, please. Uh, uh, we, have, we have seen that uh, when we calculated the EQD2 for the boost phase, uh, the OIRs we are able to, and the, the, for the PTV we are able to uh, get a very high dose compared to the IMRT boost arm. You can see a statically significant difference between the BD that we are able to achieve for the PTV and for the OIRs we are able to achieve very less dose compared to the external beam. Next please. So they are all statically significant. Next please. So that, so that is the main advantage of doing a, a, a prostate. Uh, uh, bracketary procedure. Here you can see that the uh, the, the the acute uh, and the late toxicities numerically they are less compared to external meme radiotherapy for the boost, uh, but uh, statistical significance was not there because the number of patients were less in this study. Next, please. Uh, next, please. These are our, uh, our publications on HDR back therapy and uh, the follow up. Uh, uh, generally, six to twelve monthly follow up with serum PSA and DIA and digital rectal examination and uh, quality of life assessment. Next, please. And this I would like to mention the PSA bounds. This is inherently seen with any uh, any any radiotherapy uh, for prostate. Uh, this is basically benign rises in the PSA uh, without any disease. Uh, this is very common with the uh, HDR bra bracket therapy procedure. It usually occurs towards the second year or so. And after uh, 36 months, generally you don't have any, any bounds. And they are all benign rises. Generally, it's accepted that the bounces are not more than two, uh, two nanogram. So, if there is a uh, rise above more than two nanogram per deciliter, we take it as a failure. The Phoenix definition is taken it's taken as a failure. So, there are many many uh, indicators for bounds. LDR has uh, LDR has more bounces than HDR. Then, if the D ninety for urethra is more, uh, then there are more uh, bounces are there. Uh, the young patients do have more bounces and uh, generally uh, next please they are all very benign bounces no, they are nothing to worry but the only thing is that you should be a little more careful when you are having a bounce to ensure that you don't over treat them and uh, uh, salvage and another area that is important for HDR bracket therapy is the salvage bracket therapy uh, Sal uh, salvage bracket therapy, what I mean is that initially the patient has received external beam or bra prostate bracket therapy and the patient fails. Patient has a local recurrence. Then you, the patient can be treated by, by bracket therapy. Uh, so, uh, what are the ideal patients? Or the prostate only recurrence, the biopsy proven disease, minimal um, morbidity from prior radiotherapy, uh, good gap is there after the initial radiotherapy. And if you are doing an MR based procedure, then of course, the patient will be able to tolerate MRI. And uh, if you are doing a rectal spacer, of course, you should consider the patient for a spacer also. Because these are uh, difficult cases where you need to restrict the dose to IR and uh, increase the dose to the uh, prostate tumor only, tumor area only. Next, please. This is the series that shows the, uh, uh, the different uh, uh, HDR salvage uh, uh, protocols. And uh, they, don't, they don't have very big number of patients, but still you can see that the, uh, the local control, uh, the biochemical failure, free survival, that decent uh, biochemical failure is available free survival is achieved with an acceptable toxicities. I think that's all. Next, please. 